Hi, welcome to the podcast. I'm Kevin. I'm Caitlin. I'm Dan. And we're back once again to talk about articles from cmuptm.blogspot.com. Uh, the first article in this segment is Hunger Game, Hun Hunger Game star Amanda Sternberg calls out white pop stars for appropriating black culture. Uh, it's by Carolyn Cox and is on the Mary Sue. Uh, the article is really more just about this video that Amanda Sternberg made uh, called Don't Cash Crop My Corn Rows in which she is uh, talking about white pop stars and how they are appropriating certain elements of black culture and how she finds that problematic. Especially when you look at that next to uh, how we treat, as a culture, how we treat black people. Right. Uh, you know, which is her main issue. That it's right. like, if we were celebrating black people and culture, it would feel a lot different, I think. But she um, talks about yeah. how, like, kind of, at the same time that people like Iggy Azalea have kind of, you know, become huge figures in hip hop. Right. Simultaneously, like police brutality and violence against black people has come more and more into the fore, um, and kind of this like national conversation about race. Mm -hmm. um, and she basically sets it up as by by giving example after example of here here are uh, white celebrities appropriating black culture, mm -hmm. and then the kicker comes at the end when when we get to um, Trayvon Martin Brown and. Um, you know, that whole string of instances, and she's like, okay, the whole list of celebrities, like, where was their voice on any of this? Like, where, where are they on this aspect of the black experience? Mm -hmm. Right, that you love uh, wearing cornrows and grills and stuff, but that you're silent when it comes to actual uh, problems. Right. Uh, and she talks about the um, Azalea Banks, Iggy Azalea Twitter beef um, from a few months ago. In which, I mean, I, I saw, you know, she shows this interview uh, with Iggy Azalea, or with Azalea Banks on Hot 97 after that whole thing happened where, I guess Azalea Banks had kind of calmed down <laughs> and was talking about, um, just kind of more frankly about why what Iggy Azalea is doing upsets her and, you know, she, she says that when, you know, when, when young people see Iggy Azalea, like Iggy Azalea basically means like for white kids, like you can do whatever you want, you, whatever you set your mind to, and tells and simultaneously tells black kids like you don't own anything, you don't even own the things that your culture created for you, and like out of struggle, like out of racial struggle, like hip, like hip hop and before that jazz, blues, gospel, spirituals, like it all comes out of like racial struggle in America. Right. Yeah, and then once we separate that part of the culture from the race or ethnicity of a person, uh, that, I mean, as you just said, like that race or ethnicity no longer owns that thing. So it's like, oh no, you have nothing anymore. We, we've, we've stripped, we've separated from the part that is you and we've made it for me, you know? It's like, and I also already have everything else um, <laughs> ever. And now I have your, your cool stuff, too, Everything which is just kind of fun and right. cute. But without you, because you're like, I don't get it. Yeah. yeah. So, I, yeah, I mean, I think that all of this was um, some food for thought. And, I mean, as we said earlier, too, it's 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 easier, it's, it's easy to look at one photo of somebody wearing cornrows, a white person wearing corn, cornrows, and to say, like, well, maybe those are just braids, I don't know. And then to look at all of these things together, once you see all of the white people appropriating all of this stuff, um, it's pretty horrifying and, and sobering. I think it would inform how I might move through the world in a different way. Yeah, I think she does a good job of identifying these different trends over time mm -hmm. and, and then constructing this kind of historical narrative mm -hmm. out of it. Yeah. I can't believe she's only 16. Yeah, she's just smart. Super she smart. hangs out with like Tommy Jones, and they're also smart, those kids. Oh, you're the future. They Thank God. Thank God. Teach them well and let them lead the way. Moving on. Uh, our next article is Christopher Eccleston, Why My Doctor Had to Be Northern. It's an article in Radio Times and it's by Sarah Doran. Dan, you seem to understand this article better than any of us. We were confused. <laughs> we were very confused. There's very little context provided in this article. But if you know what's going on, it's a good article? Yeah. Question. 
currently am the only one of us who's watched Doctor Who. Yeah. Um, an I am noticing now, looking at this article, since I am now aware of your confusion, that they never mention we're talking about Doctor Who. Yeah. They right. just refer to Time Lords and Doctors and just hope you get it. I gleamed that they were talking about like a guy playing a doctor. <laughs> <laughs> but I was like, is this Doctor Quinn Medicine Woman, <laughs> is it ER, where are we? Doctor Doolittle. So I recently read another article about this that was a little bit more informative. Um, and basically the, the issue is that, so, so Christopher Eccleston, he was the, the first person to play the Doctor when they rebooted the series um, recently. Um, not super recently anymore, but, um, and so he was only on for one season, and then David Tennant took over. And so there's, you know, I think there's always been a little bit of <coughs> speculation. It's been the topic of conversation. You know, why was he only there? Why was he there for such a short time? I had actually heard that you know David Tennant was originally supposed to be him, and he wasn't available, so it was like a temporary thing. Anyway, so it recently came out in an interview um, that you know, a little bit more background on why he left, and uh, Christopher Eccleston has a bit of, I, I, from my understanding, he is um, from like a, from a northern part of England, he has an accent that is not the, the sort of um, Benedict Cumberbatch, um, like, Queen's English. super Queen's English, <laughs> you know, he, he has an accent that is associated with, like, working class. And so it was really important for him, as an actor in this role, with this long legacy, to have an iteration of the Doctor that had that accent and could, you know, you know, didn't have to conform to, to, you know, that you have to, you have to speak perfect, proper English and not be working class to, to be the Doctor. The Doctor can be, can be so much more than that. And apparently there was some, um, there was some tension, I think, the writers, uh, or from his account, the writers didn't really want to have a doctor, they didn't really like having a doctor who, um, you know, didn't speak proper who, English. Who, they didn't want a working class doctor. And so that, I think, created some tension. Although it's interesting, it's like they didn't want any, a working class, it's that they didn't want somebody with a working class accent. You know, it's not even that they didn't want a working class doctor. Yeah, right? they didn't want the character to be working class. They just wanted to the talk accent. like he wasn't working class. Yeah, which is really interesting. And I'm, I mean, I can only imagine what's that, what that's like. But I guess you see it in America, where it's like you know, people with certain kinds of accent. I mean, you see it with uh, stereotypes of people in the South too, where it's like if you have a, a heavy drawl, you aren't as smart, probably. You know, like if you're just looking at, at movies. Are you and, saying? Are you not, saying it's a stereotype? No, 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 that's a stereotype. I don't believe that. But like, if you watch a movie or something, like the stereotype yeah. of like somebody who's not smart is that, and we're like, well, yeah. that can't be true. But it's like you can imagine that those would be pretty harmful stereotypes yeah. if you're living your life uh, with whatever accent you have. Uh, so I would like it's great. I hadn't thought about that that much uh, in an English class. And he's kind of cute. And he's so cute. So, I, but it's he was my favorite doctor. It's too bad that that it looks like it didn't work out, you know yeah. what I mean, that like he made this point and then he left, you know, so I... He looks kind of lost in the soda, he's kind of like standing in front of an ocean with some mountains behind, like, where do I go now? Right. Where do we go now? This the answer is amazing. to the next article. <laughs> Did you like that transition? I loved it. Uh, the next article is Behind the Scenes of Disney Cruise Line's Tangled the Musical by Ray Smale on DisneyParks.Disney.Go.com. This was a particularly uh, vapid, <laughs> vacuous puff piece that offered no real behind the scenes look at Disney's Tangled the Musical. Um, it lost me at the title Disney Cruise Line. <laughs> Well, I mean, if it had if it had offered like literally anything interesting to say about like how the production was developed or put on, that would have been great. Yeah. But it's just full of of these are direct quotes. One of those stories everyone can fall in love with, and something for everyone. Yeah. It's like, what? Can I be honest with you? I 
watched this and I was confused for a, a while, like a few, like 10 seconds. I was thinking, is this the ad before the piece? <laughs> I was like, because I was like, oh, they're targeting people interested in Tangled. So I was like, okay. And then I thought, and then it's over. And, see, and then you're like, this is a really long ad. Yeah. And then it's just over. I thought that like no. we were gonna see that like how we made anything no. or see any anyone like, making no. it. No. No. And I wonder if part of that is because they do have this these weird policy when you play Disney characters that like you can't tell anyone. Uh, specifically, that you will play this character. You say, on um, like on the day that I was playing Ariel, for example, I would say, I was hanging out with Ariel that day. What? I saw Ariel that day. Yeah. You can post things on your Facebook of you as the character, but you can never say, this is me as Ariel. You're saying. And the idea is that you're protecting it for kids, but like the effect is very cult like to me. That's <laughs> strange. Yeah. So maybe that's part of this too, is that like we can't show you the behind the scenes because there aren't any. <laughs> I don't know. Until then, I'm Kevin. I'm Caitlin. And I'm Dan. We'll see you in a minute. Oh! 